Happy Sabbath. I love saying that. I was not raised a Sabbath keeper, but now by God's grace I am one. Before we begin, I'd like to have a word of prayer, and so if you'd like to bow your heads or kneel with me, that would be great. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for your tender mercies toward us. We're so thankful for Jesus and his great sacrifice for us. We're thankful for the ministering angels, your Bible, the spirit of prophecy. Lord, you have blessed us with so many gifts. And now, Father, we appeal to your throne that you would bless us with the Holy Spirit so we may understand what it is that we look into today. Father, it's been a long day, but it's been a blessed day. And I pray that you would quicken our minds, that we can understand the reading of your word. For we ask this in the all-sufficient name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> My message is entitled, No Plan B. No Plan B. There is God's plan, and then any other plan that man has devised is what we would call a plan B. And all other plan Bs are bogus. Amen. Only God's plan, plan A if you will, is something that we want in our lives as Christians today. Christ our righteousness. Righteousness by faith. These are quite magnanimous terms. They're benevolent. They're terms that unfortunately some are a little confused by. Some are even a little scared by. But there are some that are actually very inspired by these terms. Christ, our righteousness. In that, those three little words, Christ, our righteousness, is actually the plan of salvation. Amen. Three little words that mean so much. Three, two different terms, Christ, our righteousness, or righteousness by faith. And I, I'd like to take the next few minutes, the next 48 minutes and 15 seconds that we have together, and I'd like to invest these minutes looking into the Word of God and in the spirit of prophecy because I believe when you invest time in God's Word and you invest time in the spirit of prophecy, it always pays back. I want my, my mind to be quickened by the Holy Spirit and I want to understand His Word. Now, I've spent quite a bit of time, my, my son can attest, my mother can attest, and so can my, my dear wife. Spent quite a bit of time in this subject for the last several weeks. And, and honestly, I started out by saying, Lord, show me what these people need to hear. <laughs> well, there's a little problem with that. I actually stopped praying that, and I said, Lord, what is it that I need to hear? What is it that you want to teach me because, Father, if you can capture my imagination, if you can capture my thoughts, then I know you can capture my brothers' and sisters' thoughts. If you can speak through a donkey, Lord, perhaps you can speak through me today. I wrote out nearly 20,000 words. <laughs> it didn't quite get there. Almost approached 20,000 words. And anybody will tell you if they've ever spent any time speaking with 46 minutes and 44 seconds left, I can't get through 20,000 words. And so last night I was up late after having some food poisoning or something. By the way, pray for my right kidney. It's killing me. But as I was up last night, I said, Lord, now... 
I need you to start editing this. I've amassed a bunch of knowledge and a bunch of information, and Lord, I need you to cut this up because it, I, I've got too much information here. I don't even know how to wade through it. I don't know what to get rid of and what to keep, and I feel like after I've amassed a bunch of information and I start cutting it away, I almost feel like I'm cheating God. But that's so good. Oh, that's good too. And so what remains is actually 7,000 words, which I need to actually speed up here and jump into the message because there's no way I'm going to get through 7,000 words either. And what's interesting is I wanted to get it down to about 4,000 words. And I said, Lord, there's a problem here. I can't cut anymore. So I'm going to go forward by faith, asking that you just edit while we go, Lord. And you tell me what you want in there because this is your message and I'm just simply a messenger. Without you, I'm dust, Lord. And so I asked God, distill this down. And so last night, early this morning, distill it down, distill it down. And God did something that really amazed me. He said, Christian, I'll distill it down for you. Why don't we take the entire subject that you've been looking into and let's distill it down to righteousness by faith. And, and Christian, it's one word. Righteous by faith is one word? That's really inefficient, Lord. Thank you. Righteousness by faith, my friends, can be distilled down to one word. Love. God so loved the world that he gave his righteous son that a sinner like me could be saved. Did you, did you, is this microphone on? Did I just say that out loud? That's good news, my friends. Jesus Christ is in the business of saving sinners of whom I'm chief. Christ, our righteousness, is the greatest illustration of his love to this world and to the universe. Christ, our righteousness. God is love. It was righteousness that drove Jesus to the cross. It was. His righteous character. He said, I, I must. They've become the subject of the enemy. I, I must. Righteousness drove Christ to the cross. It was love for fallen man that compelled him to go forward. Since God is love, there was no other action he could take because love is not about itself. Love is about others, and God is about others. Wow. Because God is love, he had to come and rescue us through the purchase of his through the person of his righteous son, Jesus Christ. Man was given a way out of the eternal death that now awaited him due to his choice to rebel. Christ died so we could live. <laughs> he made a way through his righteous act to save each soul that would choose to be saved. You see, it is a choice. We choose to sin or we choose to surrender. We choose self, or we choose Christ. It's that simple, friends. I eventually found Jesus Christ. I accepted him as my personal savior in my mid-twenties. And for the first time in my life, I began to find answers. I began to find peace and even joy, which I didn't have much of that in my abusive home growing up. He had captured my heart. And I eventually dedicated my life to him to serve him until there's no breath left in me. And by his grace, that will happen. Or Jesus will come first. Amen. I basically learned that there were certain things I needed to do and certain things that I shouldn't do. That's basically what happened for me. I was basically given a righteous list of things that a Christian would do, and then here's an evil list of what Christians wouldn't do. So I began, and I actually like lists. That's very good for me, a type A personality. I love a bunch of lists. It's very efficient for me. I have several lists on my smartphone, and I delegate to all the different workers in the ministry. 
I really like lists. And so I was just efficient at making lists. So I made up a bunch of lists of basically, mentally, that, of what I needed to do. This is, unfortunately, a dangerous thing to do as a brand new Christian. Because what happened was, my focus was turned to Christ who had saved me, and who wanted to change me to all the things that I was going to do now to fix myself. Can, can anybody relate? Oh, there's a few of you here too. Okay, how you doing, Brother Pharisee, Sister Pharisee, how you doing? <laughs> so, unfortunately, I became more of a student of doctrine and theory than a student of Christ and His righteousness. My love for Him, it began to grow cold under the weight of my personal efforts to keep the law and all the things that I had, I had learned. I actually became discouraged and overwhelmed. And, and I don't like to say this, but my wife, Kobe, and I, we actually got to a place where we almost left the Seventh-day Adventist faith because, friends, it's too hard to save yourself. Amen. That's where I was. It's impossible. I knew Jesus was my Savior and that He had forgiven me for my sins and that I was justified in the sight of God because of the sacrifice of his son on my behalf and God is just and is the justifier and I thought it was now up to me to get rid of all the sin in my life. You see, he justifies me but I sanctify me. No, I, 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 you know that's not true. You've been here all day. But I didn't have this experience. I didn't have this information. I didn't realize what Christ our righteousness was. I didn't understand it, friends. I thought it was, he justifies me. In other words, I come to him, I confess my sins, I accept him as my savior, and I am, I am uh, free from sin. I am forgiven. I'm justified. Just if I'd never sinned, right? Amen. Praise God. But I thought the rest of it was, now you figure out all the do's, you figure out all the don'ts, and like a good little Christian, you, you do them, or you don't do them. What a, what a burden. What a, what a yoke of bondage, friends. Do you realize, as Seventh-day Adventists, as Sabbath keepers, Keeping the Sabbath doesn't even save us? Do you realize that keeping the law of God cannot and will not ever save you? Oh, some of you are getting nervous now. Oh, what's this, this heresy? <laughs> so, I knew he was my savior. I knew he'd forgiven me for my sins and that I was justified in God's sight because of the sacrifice of his son on my behalf. But like I said, I thought it was up to me now to get rid of the sin. And so my sanctified life needed to start. And this is where I got confused. And this is where I actually started to get a bit discouraged. I had lost sight of Jesus and his word. And I lost sight of his righteousness. And I began to focus in on my own righteousness. But I was confused because the Bible said that my righteousness was as filthy rags. But I was in the word and the spirit of prophecy more than ever now in my life. I was searching for what else I needed to do. And what I, you know, like I said, I'd make up all my mental lists of do's and don'ts. And then I would just hunker down to do this thing called Christianity. I was going to do this. If anybody could do it by trying, it was going to be me. Well, friends... I needed to have my eyes redirected to Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, it, it would be many years before I would discover Jesus Christ as my Savior. He became hidden underneath my Christless, self-willed efforts to keep the law. Honestly, I just wanted to be saved. I just wanted to go to heaven. I, I just wanted to make my Father in heaven proud of me. You know, I, I just wanted to be a good person. I, I wanted to be a light in this world. So my motive was pure. It was in the sense of, I just wanted to be a light. I just wanted to, to learn some things and regurgitate it and, and inspire other people. But friends, the problem was, I was slipping further away in my heart from God, while on the outside everything looked okay. 
You know, I, after all, I had the right version of the Bible. I ate the right food. And I went to church on the right day. You, you get my drift. On the outside, things were looking okay. But I knew on the inside, there was a disconnect. Something was wrong. You know, I went to church on the right day. I paid my tithe. I, I became an elder in my church. I was an attentive husband. and By God's grace, a, a good father. Eventually, I was running a ministry. But I was a Pharisee. And I didn't even know it at the time. Because when you're deceived, you're deceived. Amen? Until you're not deceived anymore. That's very logical, right? So that's why deception works. I, if I'm deceived, I don't know that I'm deceived until I'm no longer deceived. And so when you study, you just find many times, if you're not careful praying for the Holy Spirit and not praying to find what you believe, but rather to believe what you find, amen, I, I would just study myself into deeper thinking, yeah, I got to do it, yeah, I got to do it, yeah, I got to do it. <laughs> and then about 10 years ago, I began to discover Christ my righteousness finally. I found Spirit of Prophecy passages that, begin, that began to stir my heart. I'd read it and I'd say, what, what? Oh, I don't understand, yet I want it so much. Testimony to ministers and gospel workers, page 91. The Lord in his great mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the up lifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited, peop it invited people to receive the righteousness of Christ. To receive it, I don't earn it, which was made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. So I knew obedience was present in a walk with Christ. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, to his merits, to his changes love for the human family. Amazingly enough, I was actually threatened by these statements. You understand? You have to understand where I came from. I came from an ultra-conservative neo-Nazi Seventh-day Adventism. You understand? And so I, I came from this perspective where if you talked about love, you talk a little bit too much about love, then you know, you're, you're, you're liberal and you know, you don't really understand that you know, this is the day of, a, the anti-typical day of atonement and all those types of things. You were a bleeding heart liberal if you talked too much about the love of God. Friends, I'll tell you what. I was taught the law of God over and over and over. And if Jesus Christ is not the center, then it is something that is not going to do you one bit of good. Not one bit of good. All it can do is reveal sin, and then you go, I'm just worse off than before I read that thing. Can anybody relate? I was in this, I was stuck. Many had lost sight of Jesus, that was me. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his marriage, and change his love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting his priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. I'm sorry, he wants to impart what? His own righteousness. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! That's what I need because my own righteousness was just driving me out of the church. He wants to impart his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. Man, that was me. That still is me, by the way. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. It is the third angel's message, which is to be proclaimed with a loud voice and attended with the outpouring of his spirit in a large measure. Christ our righteousness became the focus. And Christ our righteousness today needs to be our focus. I had lost sight of Jesus, my first love, and I started to rediscover my first love. Because love is the key. Christ is love. God is love. Therefore, Christ is the key. 
a correct theory of the truth. This is um, um, Testimonies to South Africa, page 72. A correct theory of the truth is excellent and essential, but the love of God, which should baptize all theories, has a power to reach all hearts. This love is what you need. You need the moisture of the dew of heaven, the melting, softening, subduing influence of the Spirit upon your heart. Amen. In regard to the redeemed at the end of time, this is a very interesting statement found in Sons and God of God 259. One interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ, our righteousness. At the end of time, there will be one subject that swallows up every other, and that is Christ, our righteousness. Because, friends, without Christ, our righteousness, we don't stand at the end of time. We fall. Are you awake this evening? Good. Praise God. So apparently I didn't understand what Christ our righteousness meant. In fact, I found I wasn't alone. <laughs> According to Christ our righteousness, page 87, there is not one in a hundred who understands for himself the Bible truth on this subject of justification by faith. That is so, ne so necessary to our present and eternal welfare. So it's not only a present truth, and it's something that we need right here in our present day, but Christ our righteousness, Christ our justification, is what we need for our eternal welfare. The enemy of man and God is not willing that this truth, justification by faith, righteousness by faith, should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. Review and Herald, September 3, 1889. You see, when we understand righteousness by faith, when we, it consumes our time, it becomes our focus, when we focus into Christ and his righteousness, then all of a sudden something's going to start happening inside of you. And the devil goes, no, 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 I won't have it. I do not want... God's people to start focusing in on Christ and his righteousness. So he invents all kinds of distractions that keep us from focusing on Christ, our righteousness. What's in your life that's distracting you? Perhaps maybe you have a job. You know what job stands for, right? Just over broke. So you, you only, only make enough to always sort of stay broke, and so you always have to be in that little, that little hamster wheel. Maybe you're so busy being under Satan's yoke that you can't even spend any time with God. I've been so busy in the work of God that sometimes I forget the God of the work. I must confess. That's not the place we need to be. Man cannot possibly... Meet the Demands, Review and Herald, February 4th, 1890. Man cannot possibly meet the demands of the law of God in human strength alone. See, some people might want to do that dot, dot, dot. Where they, 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 only, want to, they only want to say, man cannot possibly meet the demands of the law of God. No, 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 no. We've got to read the whole sentence. In human strength alone. So in other words, I need a strength outside of myself so I can meet the demands of the law. I mean, that's what the Bible's teaching us. That's what we're going to see as we continue on. His offerings, his works, will all be tainted with sin. The law demands righteousness, and the sinner owes this to the law. But he's incapable of rendering it. So in other words, I cannot without him. I cannot. You know what incapable means, right? Incompetent. In other words, I am incompetent to render obedience by myself. I am not good enough to render obedience. I am feeble. I am unqualified. According to the spirit of prophecy, we are incapable of rendering obedience unto the law, keeping the law. So these two 
quotes that we just read tell us two different things as to why we can never be justified by our own works. First, we are incapable of producing good works without Jesus Christ. Second, everything we do is valueless because it's tainted with our choice to sin and our own selfishness. We can never, 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 never trust our own righteousness. It's dangerous and it's deadly. Christ is the only way. Review and Herald. By the way, I spent a lot of time reviewing Herald. There is so much good information there. November 11, 1915. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. And now he offers to take our sins, give us his righteousness. And if you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then your, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake. Whose sake? I'm actually saved, not even for me. I am saved, I am pardoned, I am forgiven for his sake. We are accounted righteous. Christ character stands in the place of your character and you are accepted before God just as you have not sinned this is good news this is the true just the definition of justification by faith a story of Jesus page 61 blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness righteousness is right doing it is obedience to the law of God for in that law, the principles of righteousness are set forth. All, the Bible says, all thy commandments are righteousness. So true justification by faith is right doing before God. So the Lord lays his requirements before us. And we say, sure, I'll do it. I can do that. I love you, Lord. I'll do it. And this seems like the obvious response. But friends, this is not the right answer. You know what? the base of Mount Sinai, they did the same thing. Lord, whatever you say, we'll do. And just a short period later, they were having a full-on dance party around a golden calf. Well, that's kind of the story of our lives sometimes, right? Lord, I'm never going to do that again. Almost the very moment you make that proclamation, in your own strength and power, you can be sure that that sin's going to come right back in your life, and you're going to go, but I thought, no. When the Lord is not in us, and we are only in us, we are never going to stand. That's plan B. Plan A is Christ our righteousness. True justification by faith is right doing before God. So it seems that many times we're saying, I'll do it. But friends, that's what we could call old covenant type thinking. I need to think in different ways, better ways. Selected Messages 1 at 343. Let no one take the limited, narrow position that any of the works of man can help in the least possible way to liquidate the debt of his transgression. This is a fatal deception. If you would understand it, you must cease haggling over your pet ideas and with humble hearts survey the atonement. This matter is so dimly comprehended that thousands upon thousands claiming to be the sons of God are children of the wicked, wicked one because they depend on their own works. God always demanded good works, she continues. The law demands it. But because man placed himself in sin by his choice, right? Where his good works were valueless, Jesus' righteousness alone can avail. Christ is able to save to the uttermost because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. All that man can possibly do toward his own salvation is to accept the invitation. Who will, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. And that's a reference to Revelation 22, 17. So my part is to accept the invitation to drink the, the water of life. You see, justification is by faith. 
Jesus is the water of life. So I need to spend time with him. I need to drink him in. I need to survey, as she says, survey Calvary. But what about my obedience? How do I develop righteousness? How, how do I get going in the sanctification process, Lord? Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 18. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. So it's not me receiving justification at the beginning and then me doing all these things to be sanctified. You see, justification is by faith. Sanctification is by faith. Period. Because friends, if I could earn my way to heaven, then God owes me heaven. No. Think of it this way. Even, no, I don't have time. I got to keep going. <laughs> Unless that was from you, Lord, then please repeat it. Not by, she continues on, she says, not by painful struggles or wearisome toil, not by gift or sacrifice is righteousness obtained. It is freely given to every soul who hungers and thirsts to receive it. So we come to God and say, Lord, I, I don't even want you right now. Perhaps that's the prayer. Then Christ, the moment I surrender, the moment I say, it's not my will but your will be done, God will even implant in the soul a thirst for him. Because really it is all him at the beginning. It's all him in the middle. And it's all him in the end. Praise the Lord. Get this dude out of the way. Praise God. Justification, being right with God, is a gift freely given. Romans 3.24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So according to the Bible, we are justified by grace. No way are we justified by our righteous, quote unquote, works. But I think this is where a lot of us struggle. We receive righteousness by receiving him. Not by my struggle, according to the spirit of prophecy. Not by my working to obtain it. It began to dawn on me that I don't, actually pray properly because maybe I'm dealing with my impatience and I would say Lord help me with my impatience I'm so impatient with so and so or I'm so impatient with this person Lord I'm just so impatient so in my prayer I was magnifying my impatience <coughs> and God showed me Christian there's too much of self alive in that prayer so now I pray even differently. I say, Lord, not me, not my righteousness. I say, Lord, I want your character. I need your righteous patience. And then I believe because God has said he will give it to me. Amen. If I ask according to his will, it'll be done, he says. Is it according to God's will that I have patience in my life? Amen. That is prayer. He says answered. Check that one up. Answered. Anytime you pray, you want, my, you want my patience? Done. I will give it to you. And then I, by faith, believe Christ has given me his patience. And I walk believing I have. And that's not just this blind thing. I kind of have it. No, it actually is Christ who wants to abide in me. If you have your Bibles, let's turn quickly to John 15, 4 through 11. Christ is talking about this abiding in him and, and him in me and me in him. John 15, 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it what? Abide in me. And no more ye except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him bringeth the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you'll be fine. You can do a lot of stuff. No, for without me, you can do nothing. You see, the motivating factor in my life must be Christ, not me. Because frankly, 
My motivation, generally speaking, is riddled with selfishness. Now, what does the word abide mean? Then we're going to fill in a couple of these as we continue. What does the word dwell, uh, abide mean? It means to dwell. It means to be. It means to continue permanently. Bear patiently or to be fixed or permanent. So in verse 12 it says, dwell in me and I'll dwell in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it exists in the vine, no more can you except you continue permanently in me. Very interesting. You're not going to have any fruit in your life unless you continue permanently in me. In other words, abide. Verse 5, I am the branch, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He that lives in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Verse 7, if ye remain in me and my words take up habitation in you or abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall be fixed in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and am immovable in his love. Desire Ages 675, the connection of the branch with the vine, he said, represents the relation you are to sustain to me. The scion is engrafted into the living vine and fiber by fiber, vein by vein, it grows into the vine stock. The life of the vine becomes the life of the branch. So the soul, dead in trespasses and sin, receives life through connection with Christ. By faith in him as a personal savior, the union is formed. The sinner unites his weakness to the str Christ's strength, his emptiness to Christ's fullness, his frailty to Christ's enduring might. Then he has the mind of Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this is Christ our righteousness. You see, what's pictured here is more than Lord who's way up there on your big old throne and we're here on this little tiny speck and I'm a little tiny person on this little tiny speck and I'm going, please help me. No, 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 no. <laughs> but that's the picture we have sometimes. Amen. That's the picture we have. I have a personal God. I have a personal Jesus that says, no, 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 no. I, my veins want to intertwine with your veins. My blood will flow through you. Another quote Ellen White says, and I'm paraphrasing, here pictured is the most intimate connection that one could have with their Savior. So I am justified by faith in Christ, and I am sanctified by faith in Christ. The moment I abide in Christ, the moment I surrender, I am accounted righteousness and given the righteousness of Christ. He lives out his life within me. When he lives in me, I die. Like Alan said earlier, two things can't occupy the same space. So I must, I don't even like that, I know, I know it's biblical, I must decrease so he, can may, he may increase, right? No, I, it needs to really say this. <laughs> I need to be empty so he can fill me up. Amen. Because when I say I have to decrease, it almost makes, me, makes it sound like there's still some of me there. But friends, when there's still some of me there, that's when I have the problems. That's when I get into trouble on a spiritual level. We have to skip this. I'll read just the end of it. So long as Satan reigns, this is uh, Acts of the Apostles 560, so long as Satan reigns, we shall have to subdue self. We have besetting sins to overcome. So long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point at which we can say, huh, I have finally attained this thing. Sanctification is the result of lifelong obedience. Are you awake? Yes. The work that we have is constantly dying. Did you catch that? Our work 
is to constantly die, to keep our eyes on Jesus. So we must die, keep our eyes on Jesus, trusting him in his ways, his will for our lives. And when we are constantly dying, our work, our our effort, our surrender, this is our part. God will never force us, but God will do his part when I surrender. You see, that's the problem that we have because there's only one power in the entire universe that handcuffs God, and that's my choice. My choice can stymie God and his plan for me. That's pretty serious, isn't it? This is our part. We surrender. God will mold us and transform us. Then, and only then when I am surrendered, and I say, no longer me, all of you, Lord, then I am in a position for Christ to really start working in my life. When self has been crucified, through the power of Jesus Christ. So he can now bring us to God. He can now bring us because we've consented, because our eyes are not on ourselves but on him. He can now bring us into alignment with God's will. You see, this whole thing that God is trying to do is just to bring man into alignment with God's will. That's it. Because friends, when I have God's will in my heart, in my life and I've come into alignment with that and once there is a certain number of people literal or figurative doesn't matter when God has his number who are completely surrendered to God's will then he will come for us so what we lost in the garden by choice was this beautiful experience with the divine influence and the human nature, and we had what was called a what? A divine nature, right? And all God wants to do is to bring us back into a place where he can fill us back up, if you will, and we can experience the divine nature once again. I want it. Oh, I pray to be among the 144,000 friends. I do. I want to be one of them. I don't know, no longer do I want to just be saved. Man, I want to vindicate the name of God, the character of Jesus Christ. Amen. But I don't do that with a haphazard, sort of, kind of, I'm going to earn my way to heaven. Only Christ can produce in me what is of the Father. So I lay a hold of him. And I say, Lord, not my righteousness, but your righteousness. And this is actually the complete beautiful picture of Christ, my righteousness. He's going to literally live in me. It's supernatural. It's super amazing. I totally don't understand it all. And if anybody tells you they understand it all, they don't understand it all. Pray for them. The reality is, Christ, our righteousness, is Christ living, taking up habitation in me. That's a mystery. That's incredible. No one can explain all the minute details of this. But you know what? I don't need to understand all the minute details because I believe God and God's word and God said it, says it, that settles it, and that's all I need. Yet there's evidences that Christ works in the life. All of a sudden, when my natural inclination would be to react a certain way, and yet I know I'm surrendered and I'm in Christ and he's in me and there's a different reaction. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. That's when all of a sudden you go, oh, I've tasted and saw that he's good. He wants to give me all the good things in my life. He wants to help me to be like him and he is awesome. He is righteousness. And this encourages my my new relationship that I have with God. Because when I am in covenant relationship with Him, when I am surrendered and He is able to take me and fill me, I am a different man right now. Right now! <laughs> right now! The problem is, I don't 
always stay surrendered. Self comes up. Especially for us type A's. Man, this is taking so long. We are pretty messed up, Christian. It's going to take a while. I'm starting to understand because now every day that I learn this new process, this new habit, if you will, of surrendering to him, surrendering the will. Fr frankly, this is the work. Surrendering the will to God and saying, not my will, but your will be done. This is the greatest work that we're ever going to do is to fight self. Christ says, take up your cross. That means something's got to die. Me. Amen. Amen. It's the greatest battle that man will ever fight is the battle of his own self. And then, as I start to have this experience where all of a sudden, it's not that I have to please God. It's not that I have to keep the commandments of God. But because he's coming into my life every time I surrender, you know, Paul talks about this. Man, that things that I would do, I don't want to, and the things that, that I, I want to do, I don't do those. He's talking about this struggle. Man, he, he was a really connected Christian, yet he had the struggle because it's a struggle against self. But once I'm, I start to taste of that and I see that there's an evidence of him in my life, I can say, I want more of that. And he says, good, die more. Oh, okay. See, this is the revelation God gave to me. I used to direct the battle at the sins in my life. So I was focused in on the sins of my life. I would direct the battle at the problems. Well, that's logical, Christian. That's what we do in war. No, wait a second. This is a spiritual war. So what I needed to do was I have, I have to direct my attention at developing the habit of dying to self and surrendering the will. Because listen, when I surrender to God and Christ comes in, is not Christ obedient? Is not Christ obedient? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Are you seeing where this is going? When I'm surrendered, I'm not focused in on all the little sins in my life, but I'm focused in on the sin solver in my life, and he comes into my heart, and I invite him in, and I say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. He says, Christian, I will give you my obedience. And that's a different kind of obedience, my friends. It is an obedience that comes because I've spent time with God. I've spent time with Christ. I have seen his great sacrifice for me, his great love for me. And I say, Lord, and it awakens this thing inside of me that says, Lord, I, I, I actually want to be like you. I actually really want to be like God, Alan. I want to be like God. And God is love. And so, all of a sudden, I, I delight to do thy will, Lord. What? Have you ever had those days where you're just delighting in the Lord? You've had them. So what that means is you can have more, yes or no? So that means I can overcome sin. I can keep the law of God. Yes or no? If Christ is in me. The hope of all glory. Christ, our righteousness. Righteousness by faith. You see, I don't focus in on the sin anymore. I focus in on Jesus Christ. What am I going to say? Lord, let's get out my list. Help me with that one and that one and that one and that one and that one. You know what? That is so exhausting. Amen. It, it doesn't work. If it would have worked, I would have been translated by now. You see, it's not about all those things. It's about Him. And when I'm focused on Him, the problem solver, and He's living His life in me, then all those other things will take care of itself. 
oh, that's not true. Let me read the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> You're stretching it, Christian. Now, if I can find it, I got just a few minutes left. <clears throat> right, this is just my quote, not her quote yet. Righteousness is actually not... Now, some of you are going to think I'm a heretic. Just follow me for a second. Righteousness is not what we do because we can't earn this, right? Righteousness is whom we have abiding in our hearts. Yes. And if Christ is abiding, then I can't help but obey. Quote, Jesus said, be perfect as your Father is perfect. If you are the children of God, you are partakers of His nature. And you cannot but be like Him. That's the promise. If I am in Him, I am a partaker of His nature, then you can't help but be like him. Don't you ever tell me I can't overcome all sin in my life. That is a plan B, and plan B is bogus. Plan B is from Beelzebub. Amen? Let's get on plan A, the plan of ascension. That was a perfect time for a hearty amen. <laughs> Laodicea, come on now. So, if we're not like him, <laughs> then we're not allowing him to fill his place in, in our hearts. Remember, it'll take, the Bible tells us that it's going to take every day, every week, every month, because the spirit of prophecy says that sanctification is a process of a lifetime. But friends, that doesn't mean that it means, it doesn't mean that, well, eventually I will have Christ's righteousness. It's not what it means. It means right here, right now, Christ will bless me with his righteousness right now. Amen. Right this second. Am I sinning? They're like, I don't know, are you? You know. <laughs> but this is the point. Am I surrendered? Am I emptied of self? And has Christ got his rightful place on my heart? This is righteousness by faith. Continuing on. That life in you, we're talking about Christ's life in you, will produce the same character and manifest the same works as it did in him. What kind of character does Jesus have? What kind of character did he have when he was here? Man, he was out serving he was out helping. He was out healing. He was crying with, playing with. Children loved to come and sit on his lap. They didn't run away from him. People loved to go wherever he was. Is that your testimony? If not, you need Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Because, friends, it just said that life in you <laughs> will produce the same character and manifest the same works as it did in him. He was obedient. He was respectful. He was loving. He was attentive. He was esteeming others better than himself all the way unto obedience unto the cross. He was of service to everyone around him. That life in you will produce the same character and manifest the same works as it did in him. Don't you dare tell me that Jesus Christ didn't overcome in his life. And if I can have the same life, I can overcome. This wretched man can become a righteous follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. And do you understand at the end of time, there will be those who have said, enough of self. I'm sick and tired of self, and I want your righteousness. Because friends, I wish we had another hour together. I'm out of time. I got like two minutes left. When God has his people, that will Accept, plan A, accept his atonement, plan A. And we'll have a, a new experience with him that will allow the Holy Spirit to come in and fill them so completely that they actually cease to sin, 
then Christ can leave the most holy place. Hello, are you with me? He can leave the most holy place because he that began the good work in us is able to complete it unto the day of what? Salvation. You see, listen, Jesus Christ needs us to reproduce his character. God needs us to be open to this plan that he has so his name can be vindicated. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about you. It's about that world out there that doesn't know this. And if we're so caught up in all this theorizing, all this sermonizing, and we're not out there sharing what Christ has done in our life, then what it is an indicator of is that Christ is not in your life. Hello? If you don't have an active plan of outreach in your own life or active in your church, then Christ has not become your righteousness. Is that too straight? It's the truth, and I love you enough to tell you the truth. Let's close with this thought. No, I got to finish this previous thought because it's, it, it didn't finish the statement. Thus, you will be in harmony with every precept of his law, for the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Through love, the righteousness of the law will be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So we need to spend time with Christ. Surrendering to the will of God is our work, and God's work is the renewing of man in holiness. We work together. What a privilege. What a blessing. God re reaches the world through sin, once sinners, but now forgiven <coughs> in the name of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.23 says, Let us be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see, God loves to create, and he wants to create new hearts in you and me. He wants to throw away the stony heart and prepare his love in our new hearts of flesh. 1 John 3.2 puts it very simply. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and one of the ways we'll know if Christ is living in our hearts is if we allow Christ to work in us so much that we even, not only just love Christ, but we even love each other. Because when Christ was asked what's the great commandment, he said, well, there's two of them. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and your brother as yourself. And friends, when we have this experience, the world will see we as a people have got something that we've never had before. We've had a lot of religion, but we have not had a lot of Christ. And when Christ is in me, and I'm loving my brothers, and I'm loving all these other people out in this world, how in the world can I steal from you if I love you? <coughs> Amen? How will I ever covet your neighbor's good or, or my, your wife if I love you? You see, love is the key. Love is Christ, our righteousness. And if I have love for you, then I have an evidence that Jesus Christ is alive. And when people finally see in our life that something is different in our Christianity, they're going to want what we have. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus under good works. Righteousness by faith is the love of God toward us, and only love can win us. Let's leave plan B behind, because frankly there is nothing called plan B. There's only plan A for ascension. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth.